So we might move on to our next speaker. And if I can call Alan Sumner to come forward. Alan is a visual artist. He's a singer. He's a lecturer. He's a health worker, founder and manager of Aboriginal Contemporary Arts. So Alan, please come forward. Give everyone, everyone can you please give Alan a welcome? Thanks, mate. I'd firstly like to acknowledge uh, traditional owners of uh, the country. Uh, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land and their elders, both past and present. I acknowledge that the Tasmanian Aboriginal people are the traditional and original custodians of the skies, water and land of Luritawitta, Tasmania, country of where their mothers and grandmothers have given birth. I acknowledge their continued connection to this country which still provides the Tasmanian Aboriginal people with food, medicine and crafts that is celebrated in ceremony. Knowledge that is over 2,000 years old. Mierna Namani Purji, Nai Narayartu, Nakaramiru, Nagarna Ngarinjari Yankurunjari Yarta, Nawangani. Uh, greetings to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Alan Sumner, the firstborn son in my family, um, the eldest out of my brothers and sisters. I come from Adelaide, uh, Ghana country, but also my grandmother's country, Udnadatta, uh, and also my grandmother's or my grandfather's country on the Koorong the lower lakes of the Murray River, South Australia. Uh, it's my privilege to come and present uh, to you today. And uh, what a lovely weather we're having. It was great the last two days. But I haven't got much time and I'm actually presenting three presentations in one. I've managed to sort of sync them all together. So let's see how we go for time. Uh, also, I have a little gift for the presenters as well. And there are some spares on the table up the back too. So if you'd like one, you'd probably need to be quick to go and get one. Uh, it's, a, it's a little pin called a Unity pin and comes with a lanyard as well. But I'll leave them here. I just want to start by, I'm actually going to be presenting on uh, some of the work that we've been doing at Flinders um, University in Adelaide, uh, but also the Northern Corridor, which consists of Adelaide, Alice Springs and Darwin. Just a bit of an overview, not too much writing now, I won't go too far on the slides there, but uh, basically look at how Flinders University are embedding Indigenous knowledges across the academy. And number two, we're going to look at Marie Meredith's uh, research into arts and health. And uh, finally, going to be talking about uh, Flinders University, the Poach Centre for Indigenous Studies, uh, right through, actually, to the Northern Corridor. We have a Poach Centre that sits in the Northern Territory, um, actually two, one in Alice Springs, Darwin, and also South Australia. Uh, I work at the Flinders University in South Australia, so the Adelaide-based campus. Um, but also, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues also in the room here uh, this afternoon. So, Flinders University, how are they embedding Aboriginal knowledges across the academy? We'll look at some of the innovative ways in which Aboriginal contemporary arts or Aboriginal art is currently being used in teaching and research efforts to bring about better health outcomes for Aboriginal people. Indigenous arts in health positions uh, indigenous culture and knowledges front and centre and argues for a strength-based approach to Indigenous health through decolonisation. Indigenous art in the higher education. So this slide was actually a part of this presentation was given to me by Flinders uh, and uh, the Flinders arts team there. And um, the information that has been shared on campus 
Uh, this is a lot of the feedback that's come back from the students and how they feel uh, the use of Aboriginal artwork across the academy is being used, so object-based learning. So talking about object-based learning, um, it's a, something that I've been doing for quite some time, but it seems like it's fairly new on the, on the front. Uh, object-based learning is, is something really, um, something that sort of sits outside your normal teaching methodologies. Uh, we've been using objects, artefacts, uh, things for, for many years now to educate uh, non-Aboriginal people, uh, but also students right across the campus. And it's, it's part of the way that we decolonise an academy. Uh, we sort of get out of the norm from lecturing in, in the halls or in, the, in a, you know, a building where we will take students outside and uh, give them objects to look at. But obviously being able to create discussions out of those objects. You can see here that just by one particular object you can draw many conversations. Uh, the one down the bottom there, we talk about the history of the object, which we find most important. But it brings up contentious issues. It's about having those hard conversations. We feel that, you know, using objects isn't so confrontational. The fact that you can put an object on a table, look at it, and respond to it, it's, uh, it allows for different questions to come up. Uh, you're able to sort of break down a lot more and have those conversations that you normally wouldn't have in a tutorial or a lecture sort of setting. I'm going to move quite quickly through these slides because we've got 40 of them. Uh, here is another one that uh, has been used by Arts and Health at Flinders Uni. Uh, again, about having the hard conversations. It's, uh, it's sometimes it's difficult to talk about the atrocities of our communities and talk about the impact of invasion in our country. Uh, can you can get very resistant in the classroom. Some people feel that they can't in, engage in a conversation because they're feeling, the, I guess they get that feeling of cognitive dissonance. It's too hard to talk about. Where artwork really provides that platform to be able to have those hard conversations, creates another level to sort of speak with students, speak with staff at different levels. I'm not going to go into the photographs or their actual artwork, but you can see that some of these uh, stories are quite powerful. This is Sally Morgan. So here's some of the student feedback. To capture the uh, imagination, uh, to communicate a feeling of experience, to provoke a visceral, how do you pronounce that word? I've even forgotten. Visceral, that's it. I'd actually put it this morning, but I forgot it. Uh, to provoke a visceral response, to open up conversations, and provide a, a space for shared reflections on challenging subject matter, and again, having those hard conversations. Here's a couple of uh, student quotes. Uh, I won't read them out. The slides will be made available to you, so if you actually want to look through some of the student quotes, that's good. There's a couple there. Okay, that's the Flinders stuff. So, yeah, those quotes are quite quick, so if you do want to actually read those quotes, feel free to grab the slides. Uh, talking about Marie Meredith's uh, work and her research, um, Marie Meredith is a Bidjitter woman from southern Queensland uh, who has been researching the health impacts of art centres in the Anangul, Pitinjara, Yankur and Jara lands in the northwest corner of South Australia. So I'd like to do just quickly go to a short clip that I found because uh, it was actually Marie Meredith that put up the abstract to come and present. And of course she couldn't come. So she asked me kindly whether I would be uh, able to step in her place. And of course I feel different like presenting on other people's work. So uh, I thought I'd grab a clip to show you uh, some of her work. Oh, I think it was meant to go straight into it, but it never, never mind. I think it might be up there later. So Marie has been basically working uh, across the APY lands, visiting uh, many rural cultural arts centres 
but also looking at the importance of those centres and what they mean for community people. Um, that it, they're not just art centres where we create art and uh, sell it off, but it, it's more than that. It's a place where people can come together, can speak, uh, talk about health issues, talk about what's going on in the community. Um, so a real community hub. But the artwork itself, as it's being produced, depending on what artists are doing the work, but it's a, it's a place for cultural expression. And, uh, of course, uh, Brother Nathan mentioned before about, uh, you know, those therapeutical practices for artists to be able to actually produce pieces of artwork uh, for themselves. They talk about their own stories, their own journeys. I won't go right into the research. Uh, again, this will be some of the slides that you can see, but Meredith, Marie Meredith sits on the other side there, the APY Arts and Health Team. So we've got Josephine there, Alison and Marie. So Marie is a PhD candidate and she used this research as part of her, for her PhD. There is a little bit more that needs to be done and I believe the Lowitcher Institute uh, have been uh, able to fund the last part of her PhD. This is the uh, journey that Marie took. So, of course, based in Alice Springs and going across the three states. So you've got South Australia, Western Australia and the Northern Territory there. Uh, huge lands, very vast, very dry, um, but absolutely beautiful. Some of the findings from her research, uh, I guess one of the challenges for Marie really was to distinguish the differences of community understanding uh, of particular words and, and what they actually mean from, I guess, a, a mainstream concept. She talks about priorities for 2019. And uh, as you can see here, we've got uh, the final report back to all industry partners. What do the partners want? There's Anangulku Arts and Culture. How far do they want Marie to disseminate? So they're actually looking at disseminating now beyond the APY lands to WA on the top end. How does Marie make the link with other industri uh, in industry and other organisations? Arts and Health Framework, NT. Uh, indigenous tourism, culture strategy. The work that she does is very important. Uh, you can see her here sitting at a cultural arts centre, represented by different elders of the community um, and narratives. The work in aged care at the arts centre. Some stuff around the policy landscape, so talking about arts and health framework, S-A-N-N-T. There's the evidence of study, which will go with that. And, of course, the dissemination of that information to key industry stakeholders. Now, this could be the actual video that we're looking for. If you let the, you know, if you let your Step. MOPA, you know, I had a MOPA that I worked with, if you let the MOPA take the lead in the research and you're following that person, I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's, an, it's a privileged journey to be a part of, you know, and to see the exchange, with, you know, between English and, and language. I think that's such an important, important thing that a researcher needs to do is to be culturally in tune with with, with, the, with what's happening. Mop is your friend and they help you navigate through the, through the, the process and the intricacies of, of, of you know, and all the culture and make sure that you're looked after and that you don't get into trouble so you have a safe passage to do the research. So my research is looking at the health promotion benefits of art centres on the APY lands. Well, people come to the art centres not just to paint art or do art. There's a number of reasons why people come there. They come there because it's a you know, good place to be, it's a happy place to be. People come there to do you know, their business with Centrelink. Artists come there to, you know, um, have, you know, other uh, organisations help with their, you know, disabilities or, um, you know, they come there because um, other family people go there. So those art centres are, 
provide a number of roles for people. So my research is about capturing the whole picture, what the art centres do. So within a health promotion framework, artists can, um, they do paintings to, to generate income for themselves. So in some of these remote communities, the art centre is the only economic um, opportunity for, for you know, people that are based in, based in remote communities. So it's not just an economic measurement, it's you, you need to take the social, you know, your social perspective. So this is why the research is so important because it does take a, um, um, it's across the discipline, so economic, social, looking at the cultural elements. So from a health point of view, we're trying to look at it holistically and also looking at the spiritual side of things, how it keeps um, more people connected to country, connected to their family. Uh, it's through the paintings that that connection is alive and meaningful and connects them to the old times in the contemporary time. There you go. So that's um, Marie's work. Uh, out of her work, of course, the teaching and curriculum development. Um, so there's a couple of things here. Utilising arts practice as a legitimate tool for teaching, embedding art uh, into across the di uh, disciplines, uh, using art as a methodology to give voice through storytelling. Uh, telling the story is a method and a way of bringing in other people's experiences of health. So we have a pilot um, object-based learning in our teaching. So I'm actually going to skip through because I know we're running out of time. Uh, here's Marie in action again working with uh, the people from the cultural centres. Looks like she enjoys herself out there. Uh, so a little bit about object-based learning. Most certainly something that we've um, added to our practice uh, at Poach in Adelaide. And uh, myself and another colleague, Dave Schoberg, have uh, been teaching into medicine, uh, nursing and midwifery. And again, we take the students out on the lawn, so not sitting in the classroom, uh, using those types of opportunities. The power of stories and sharing of culture. Um, I've got up the top there recognition versus relationships and I've always said that uh, you remember the campaign that come out recognition uh, and it was on the ads on the TV quite, for quite some time and I'd said to myself you know we, you can't force anybody into recognizing your culture. Uh, it only happens through relationship and so you know we, when we talk about art we talk about the process of building relationships between each other. So the narrative, again, being very important. The journey, the ceremony, the healing, the relationships, of course. Uh, being out of the university campus and off-site, being able to put a fire on the country. Um, today we've got many regulations about fires and when fires can be lit. Um, when we speak to our people, it's something that is important for us is our fire. Um, it keeps us grounded on the country and uh, it's, a, it's a spiritual thing. So again, using object-based learning here. Here we've got some of the objects in some of the um, med students' labs. Uh, the public art, so stuff that we've been doing on the street. Um, looking at spaces where we now can leave cultural imprints in our communities. Uh, for many years we've been, uh, I guess, scared of putting our artwork on the street simply because of the desecration and the, the, the resistance of people that uh, don't like our people will rock up to those sites and pretty much desecrate those sites. So we sort of changed that around and through the help through funding and local councils is that we can now start to, uh, I guess, put our imprint back on the ground and bring our languages back, start seeing our languages around the place into public spaces. Here's a couple more photos. I won't show you that video. We'll move straight on to there. Uh, just wanted to, if I've got some time now, just wanted to go into... Uh, i got to click on that, don't I? Can I click? Ah, 
There's just some uh, videos that are, are a bit of a slideshow that I wanted to play. Um, artwork as a very powerful tool for myself. I've been an artist for quite uh, some years now. Um, and I've sort of moved into the graphic design sort of the space uh, where we can create lots of different things, uh, branding for organisations, shirts, all those types of stuff. But more importantly, uh, again, being able to leave our cultural footprint on the ground. Uh, one of the things, uh, again, when Nathan mentioned about the therapeutical type of practice, particularly for artists themselves, the using art for healing, uh, the, this particular part was a very important process for me, uh, especially in terms of the healing. Uh, I had SAMRI in Adelaide, the uh, Centre for uh, all the Research for Health uh, in, in Adelaide. They came to me and asked, look, Alan, we would like to share your story. Could you give us an artwork piece for our cancer uh, journey booklet? And um, I thought... I wonder what I could actually produce and uh, that was the link that I was going to show you there and I know I'm running out of time but it was a story where I could uh, through that process of creating this piece of artwork uh, for the cancer control plan uh, the story was about my journey in cancer when I was uh, in my teens I developed a cancer a teratoma uh, which was quite life-threatening uh, I went through treatment uh, chemotherapy. I had about four or five cycles of chemotherapy and I lost my hair. I just started a role at the school working as a, an Aboriginal education worker. I was young and uh, I just, yeah, I lost my hair. I lost my eyebrows. I lost everything. It was a quite a massive journey. And uh, when this opportunity came about, this arts project and to be able to develop a piece of artwork to reflect that journey, I, I remembered back you know, 20 years ago, what that journey was like, and I was able to actually put it into an artwork form. And through that whole process, therapeutically, it just, you know, going back and looking now, I was only 19, um, but, you know, I asked myself a range of questions. Why? Why, why is this happening to me? But again, uh, that process of being able to create the artwork helped me to bring understanding to the process. So, uh, thank you.